Once again, good afternoon and a warm welcome to our webinar from Dream to Reality, a pediatrician's journey. I'm Yi Ying and I'll be the moderator of the day. First of all, we are very delighted to have Dr. Alex Tang Tok Hon with us today. Dr. Alex has worked at KPJ Johor Specialist Hospital for 35 years as a consultant pediatrician with special interest in neonatology and respiratory medicine. He was also an associate professor with Monash Clinical School Johor Bahru since its formation 15 years ago. Besides, Dr. Alex is active in community service in which he has started a heart fund to finance poor children for heart surgeries, set up a resource center for autism, and also a baby hatch in Johor Bahru. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Lim Kya Son, who is currently a consultant pediatrician in the private practice, Joy Care Pediatrics. She graduated from the MBBS program from University of Malaya and proceeded to obtain her membership of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Together, they will be sharing their pathways of becoming an excellent pediatrician, including the challenges faced during the journey, along with real-life experiences and stories of practicing to all the aspiring pediatricians present here today. Okay, okay, so let's start. So the first question is, what inspired you to pursue a career in pediatrics? So maybe I'll address this to Dr. Lim first. Uh, okay, actually my answer is very simple. It's just because I love children. I mean, from a very young age, ever since uh, probably primary school or secondary primary school onwards, I actually love children. I like to play with my younger cousins and I have a very young brother, nine years younger than me. So since her childhood, I have decided that whatever ambition, whatever career that I'm going to do, it will be related to children. Either being a teacher or being a doctor. As time passed by, I guess, you know, as you do well in your study, somehow your parents will encourage you to become a doctor. Huh? So since I entered the medicine, then automatically I will choose pediatric as uh, the subspecialty that I want to involve in. And I enjoy watching the children growing up healthily. And I feel that taking care of children is a very happy thing because they are in the innocence that they have and the smile on their face as you treat them. Especially if you see those very sick child coming in, very sick, cannot interact with you. But in the end, after your treatment, and the child actually became healthy and they can get back to their smile and then they can get, a, get back running back, you know, running around again and they walk home happily. I feel that that is a very rewarding kind of experience. Yeah, sounds very heartwarming and I'm yeah. glad that you found inspiration. Uh, Dr. Alex, how about you? Well, uh, actually, after I finished my uh, MO ship and uh, I, deciding what to specialize in, is it? and I look at myself and I find that actually I'm good for nothing. So, <laughs> you know, when you're good for nothing, then you have to decide what you want to do as your specialty. Okay, I mean, I, I have this choice between psychiatry and uh, pediatrics. And it was at that moment, I actually was working in uh, Hospital Bermai. Okay, I was in Hospital Bermai as a doctor, not a patient, okay? Uh, so, uh, Hospital Bermai is a mental hospital. So, so I was doing a two-year uh, 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 so-called outstation equivalent. So I was treating uh, patients in uh, psychiatry and I enjoyed psychiatry, psychiatry and uh, psychology. Okay, but I also enjoy peace. You know, as uh, Dr. Lim says, I enjoy playing with children and seeing them grow. So I, I have to make a decision in which I want to specialize. Okay, and I, I thought about psychiatry. Psychiatry is fun. You know, you dig a lot of secrets uh, all, and then you go very deep and you dig up all the dirt and then you can talk all the theories. But you just talk and talk and talk and they don't get well. So you just keep on talking. Uh, no apologies to all people who want to be psychiatrists. But I think they just talk. So I thought maybe uh, I'll do uh, pediatrics. Uh, because, well, I like to see children grow, and it's the only medical discipline you can play with your child, your patient. You know, you do ONG and you play with your patient, you go to jail. So in peace, okay, you're allowed to play with your your patient. So, 
So in the end, that's how I end up with uh, pediatrics. Okay, thank you, Alex. So the next question is, what is the typical educational pathway to become a pediatrician, let's say in Malaysia? And what was the path that you took to become one? Uh, Dr. Alex, you want to try? Now, my mind is a very old, old, uh, around 40, 40 years ago pathway. So I think, why don't uh, Dr. Lim highlight uh, the, the latest pathway first? All right. Then we can comment on it. Okay. Uh, I would like to share a screen uh, because I prepared a simple uh, sort of summary of what I get from the latest pathway to become a pediatrician. My pathway author is a, a Hard to say. It's more modern than Dr. Alex way, but I guess mine is also about nine, ten, probably ten years ago kind of thing. So let's see what the latest one has. I will share my screen. Yeah. Actually, can you see the screen? Uh, not now. Uh, can you see now? No. No. Wait, uh, no. How we uh share screen. Yeah, we can see now. We can see now, right? I should next slide show, right? Yeah, actually, um, this is very difficult for me to draw myself, so I get a screenshot. Basically, this is an overview of uh, the educational pathway that you have. Of course, you must graduate, you must pass your undergraduate exam, and you know, and you can come out and work as a house officer. So what the, you can see, this is the entry point and this is the exit point. Before you can even enter the entry point, you must, uh, there are actually two pathways that you can follow, either university pathway or the MOH pathway, or they also call it a parallel pathway. So you can see over here, there is this EPA. This is called the Entrustable Professional Activities. So later we will go into more detail. I will show you what is it. It is actually like the basic professional skills you must have before you even enter the program. Then if you choose the parallel pathway or the MOH pathway, that means you take the uh, exam paper from the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. So you will take the MRCPCH. So as you know, there are three theory parts there. There's part 1A, part 1B, and part 2A. So as long as you get any one of them, either 1A or 1B or 2A, so this with this, this is your prerequisite. Whereas uh, the other pathway is that you can also go and um, you can, I think, apply online to get to this master's entrance exam and you pass it, pass this exam and get the proof that you have passed this exam. Then with this also, you can enter into the program. They have standardized the two, either university or MOH, so that both candidates will also receive four years of training. And this four years is a minimum. Um, previously, during my time, there is no structured program for the MRCPCH. So you can actually finish your exam very fast. You finish your 2B fast, then you do your gathering for 18 months, then you are out as a pediatrician. You finish it really fast. You probably don't even go through four years of pediatric training previously during my time. So some of my friends uh, who did their exam really fast, they actually came out as a pediatrician uh, very early. But now they have make it a compulsory thing that everyone, no matter you go through which pathway, you must have four years of compulsory training. That is a minimum. But of course, there is also a maximum. If you keep on failing your assessment by your supervisor, keep on failing your exam, there is a limit to your training. And the limit is seven years. If within seven years, you cannot pass all the necessary requirements, then you will be out from the program. Okay, so within these four years, if you are doing the university pathway, then you have master's one exam, which is the theory paper. Lah. And then you also have master's part two, which is the clinical exam, which includes long case, short case, and some emergency kind of uh, uh, scenario that they test you via viva. Whereas on the other side, if you are doing the parallel pathway, you will be working in an accredited hospital. You may go through different rotations within the hospital that you, that you work in. Then, of course, you have your own supervisors in that hospital while you're working in the pediatric posting. Then you have to sit for your MRCPCH Part 2B. Again, it is a clinical exam that you will go through 12 stations of rotation that include different subspecialty. Lo. So say you, you actually pass your 2B exam really early before the four years actually finish. You cannot visit the program. 
Okay, but to as part of the requirement to exit after these four years, within these four years also, you must pass your 2B clinical exam. Then only once you exit from this, you will be gazetted for six months. So now both the university and the MOH pathway will be gazetted equally for a six month period of time before you can be, you can go for your NSR, the National Specialist Regist uh, Register Registration and be registered as a pediatrician in the Malaysia NSR, uh, you know, the group okay so for this entry point is where you have to actually apply to this uh, special committee so as you see the pathways right both M uh, moh or the parallel pathway as well as university they have similar curriculum the only thing different is the exam the exams that you're going to sit are different if not the rest are the same you have minimum four years training you have a maximum of seven years and the entry requirements, entry process, the syllabus, the training format, assessment tool, and exit criteria, they are all the same. It's just that it is done in a different hospital and probably by the different uh, ministry. So in university, there are only four local universities that actually offer the university pathway, that is UM, UKM, USM, and UPM. And they are all organized by National Pediatric Conjoint Board, meaning that these all four universities will have their own representative and they will represent this National Pediatric Conjoint Board. And the entry is you need an MMAT entrance exam. And for us, whereas for the parallel pathway, you work in the air accredited MOH hospital, you must have this either 1A, 1B, or 2A. And this entry requirements is divided into four main categories. That means first, you must fulfill the professional registration and experience. You have to get your MMC registration and you get your APC. So of course, for this, you have to complete your housemanship training, pass your housemanship training. Then only you can apply for this MMC registration. You complete your houseman training. And under this professional experience, you must have at least four months of pediatric posting, either during housemanship or as an O. Uh, I also don't know nowadays the houseman, uh, how many, because nowadays the houseman training, they also change. So I'm not sure how long is the houseman training now. Is it two years or is it one? He used to be two years before I leave the government hospital where they go through different rotations. There are six rotations that they need to go through. If that is the case, definitely you will have your four months of uh, pediatric posting. Okay? But this is one of the requirements. Next, you must have the professional skills category fulfilled. And this is where your seven EPAs come in. So there will be a form that your supervisor uh, will be filling up for you. And these seven entrusted professional activities are asthma, acute gastroenteritis, neonatal jaundice, fits, venipuncture, immunization, and consent for blood product transfusion. So your supervisor will have to fill up this form that include whether are you competent enough to deal with this seven areas which is considered as basic pediatric skills before you can enter into the exam. So, so the third area is the professional knowledge. So with your professional skills, you must also have professional knowledge. And this is proven by your exam, the exam result that you do. So in the university part, pathway, that is where the MEDEX exam can, uh, come in, where you have to go online and apply for it. So this is the medical specialist pre-entrance exam. Of, of course, on the other hand, if you work in the government hospital under the MOH, you can take your own MRCPTH, either part 1A or 1B or 2A. As long as you have any one of this part, you have fulfilled this requirement of professional knowledge. Then you can apply for it. And the fourth area that they are looking at now is the commendable criteria. So this one is you have to show proof that you participate in activities affirming that you have keen interest in working with children. Because if you do not have passion for children, I guess it's very difficult for you to continue your career as a pediatrician where you have to work with children the whole of your lifetime. Because children can be noisy sometimes. So if you do not have patience for children, you do not have passion for children. So the board feel that you probably will not enjoy your posting. Huh? So because of that, they want to have... <laughs> They want to fit this commendable criteria where they see either you participate, like you know, you go, you go for pediatric courses like NRC, like those uh, pedi advanced pediatric life support, or you attend pediatric congress or any 
the causes related to heat, or you actually are involved in any community-based activity related to children, or humanitarian activity related to children. So you must also show this before you apply for your the entry point into the pediatric uh, uh, training. Okay. So the entry process is once you have once you fulfill the four these four main areas, you must have all this before you even start the beginning of your four years of training. So the entry point is that you must go and apply to this national pediatric postgraduate training committee. There is a form for you to fill up and it is available online. Which I tried to search for it just now, but I couldn't really exactly find the form. But then I can send you, you know, the handbook that they have. Inside the handbook, there is actually forms. I believe in the hospital, if you work in the pediatric posting, the bosses and the head of the department sure will have this form. And you just have to probably let your boss know. And they will actually give you a form that you can fill up. And this form will be then, of course, plus all the documents that you need to show the four areas that we have mentioned just now and then you will make a formal application. Then only they will set the date of your first the beginning of your pediatric training because you must fulfill four years before you can exit. So you don't waste too much time waiting and waiting like, because with, whenever you start to apply, the date is set, then the four years will be counted from then onwards. Right? So of course, after that, I don't go through all the training like, because then it will be a bit too early to talk about this. You just need to know how you can enter. By the time you enter, you will know what to do like, because then your boss will actually guide you through, okay? But basically, you have to go through uh, probably three monthly. You have to go through uh, probably not at least a nine months of general pediatry and a few months on neonatology. And depending on which hospital that you work in, then you will probably go through a few uh, rotation of the different specialty training. And uh, you, you will actually be subjected to a perfectly monthly assessment by your supervisor. There will be a form that they need to fill up. There will be a lot of case-based discussions, a lot of feedback form that your, uh, your supervisor will have to send back to the MPPTC. Okay. Then finally, when can you graduate as a pediatrician? <laughs> so just now, this is the NSR criteria. You must be fully registered with MMC. You must have your postgraduate degree, either the you know, master in pediatrics or MSCPCH. You can have other qualifications which I'm not too familiar with, like from Ireland and from Australia and from America. Okay. Then, then you must complete your postgraduate training, the one that we mentioned just now, the minimum four years. And during the four years, you must have satisfactory postgraduate training. There is a portfolio, then this portfolio will consist of logbooks. There will be a few core, there's quite a lot of core procedures that you need to fill up, like lumbar puncture, or chest tube insertion, intubation, you know, all these important core procedures that you need to do. And then uh, really UPA, UPC kind of uh, insertion. So there will be a logbook for you to fill up, and your supervisor will write a report on your clinical core competency, and you also must do a publication, a research project, and you have to uh, publish either a case report or public proper study or you present a paper or present a poster in some congress. It becomes a must now. Those, uh, if, you, if you want to be uh, gazetted as a pediatrician and be registered in the NSR. So this is one of the requirements now. Okay, subsequently, once you are gazetted, you complete these four years, then you have to go for gazettement. So this number four is the gazettement, which is a six-month gazettement. You have a post-qualification supervised working experience. So you'll be gazetted under an accredited hospital. And this time, during these six months, while you're working as a pediatrician supervised by your consultant, you must have a satisfactory report from your consultant. Okay, so now it's the same for both masters and uh, MRCPCH, it is both six months. Previously, before they have this structured, uh, standard, standardized kind of program, MRCPCH uh, candidate used to have to do 18 months of gazettement, whereas the master will only do six months of gazettement before they are recognized and get the NSR registration. So basically, they are the educational pathway. For me, personally, I did the MRCPCH pathway the last time. Uh, but I didn't do it very short because I sort of take my own sweet time. And then, of course, along the way, you know, there's a life thing that you have to get married, la, have children, la, and the children will then slow down your progress also. <laughs> so, and, and, and at one point, I actually feel that, um, how to say, 
I feel that if I pass too fast, even if I pass my 2B too fast, I am also worried that I don't have enough working experience to work independently as the pediatrician who can have a good clinical judgment. So I choose not to do it fast at that point of time. So I actually started my part one. I mean, I graduated in 2002. I think I took my part one in 2000. I took my part one in 2003, 2003, end of 2003. That, but after part one, I actually waited for quite some time. It was a very long time because subsequently I was also sent to the district. Uh, I work in Sarawak at that point of time. So I was sent to district. I was in district posting almost for about 18 months. So it's very difficult because I am not in the proper pediatric kind of training. So I feel that definitely I won't be competent enough to really run. Even if I pass my exam, so I decided just to wait until I get back to the training hospital where I can get back to pediatric posting. Uh. I think I only took my 2A in 2007. That was a long year before I actually pursued back the 2A. Then subsequently 2B also, I only took it in 2009. Yeah, so that's my thing. Uh, Dr. Alex? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. I think this is very informative and very useful. Okay, and... Uh, uh, for me, uh, I graduated, or rather, I get my specialist degree in 1987. Uh, that's before all of you are born. Uh, that's the time of the dinosaurs. Okay, so so actually, I went through the what you will call the parallel pathway, mainly because there's no uh, government pathway or ministry, uh, what because there was not uh, formal training. In a set, uh, universities are not having master of, of medicine courses, so all of us go through the parallel pathway. And during that time, you'll be surprised to learn that there's only one consultant pediatrician per state in the whole state. You know, nowadays you you throw a stone, you hit a specialist. Okay, at that time, specialist is so rare. There's only one specialist per state. So. Uh, I went through the MRCP pathway. Uh, they don't even divide into bits. It wasn't before the MRP, MRCH. It was just uh, pediatrics. I mean, uh, MRCP, part one and part two. Part one is the theory. And then you have to send at, uh, at least uh, four to six years of clinical experience before you can take the part two. Okay, so... So then after that, if you pass your part two, then you have to come back and it takes about two years for gazette. So so basically in the in about that's about 40 years ago. Uh, I'm glad that they systemized the training. Okay, on how to become and who is a pediatrician. Because at that time it's Wow West, all the cowboys running around and all that. Now at least it's more structured. Okay. That's all, all my comments on that. All right. Thank you, doctors, for the informative sharing. So as a follow-up question, do you have any tips and strategies to survive or even stand out in training or master's program? That, that one, I leave to Dr. Lim. How do you survive master's program? She didn't go through last master's. I mean, like uh, the specialist training. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess but Alex probably we have to go the same experience. I'm just both do the parallel pathway to the MRCP. <laughs> but yes, I guess so how to go through it. I think you just have to work hard on. I, I personally feel that whatever you study, right, you may not remember a lot of things. It's actually the patients that you see. Because uh, it's like when you're working, I think that you should get yourself involved in as many patients as you can when you are in the posting. I personally find that it's very helpful. Um, I guess I was also very lucky when I was when I did my pediatric posting, I actually did it back in Cebu, Sarawak. And at that time, the pediatric department in Hospital Cebu, I have a group of pediatricians over there who are really very dedicated. I like their spirit of working. And actually, I'm, I'm glad that I actually work under them because uh, they, what to say, uh, they, they, the, the way they work, right, 
I can see a lot of commitment in them and a lot of dedication. And to them, like if a child comes in, say we go home at five o'clock, right? But then if a child comes in at like 4.45, the child can eat you. No one will go home. Man. None of my pediatrician will go home. So as yeah, the MO, you also won't go home. Because even though you're not on call, even though the, the call already strikes five, none of us will go un until all of us actually stabilize the child. And then once the child stabilized, only we pass over to the on call person. Um, I know that's, that's the kind of dedication that I see. And that time, uh, the pediatrician who is in my hospital, they also they, they taught us a lot of things uh, because during rounds, uh, they actually taught us a lot. We would do the round, there's a lot of questions that they throw to us. And then um, I find that, uh, that, that whatever that the doctors have taught us, the lecturers have taught us during whatever work clinical work that we do are the things that I actually remember when I study my book. So you cannot learn pediatrics. I guess it's not just pediatric alone. I think the whole medicine is like that. It's not something that you can read from the book and you become a great doctor. You can only become a better doctor as you see more patients. You have your hands on on the patient. So then you will realize what kind of weakness do you have? What kind of strength do you have? And what kind of learning experience uh, what are the mistakes that you can learn from managing a patient? And you can also learn from your friends and your colleagues. So, um, why would I would say, huh? Yeah, basically, that my personal strong feelings is the hands on experience is important. You should try all your whatever you can to put your hands on most of the patients that you can see that comes along your clinical career. What do you think of that? <laughs> No, I agree with you. I agree with you. I mean, uh, in my time, uh, we have three rounds a day. Morning round at uh, 6 o'clock. Then we have uh, uh, afternoon round at 2 o'clock. And then we have uh, evening round at 9 p.m. And everybody has a 10. It doesn't matter whether you're post-call or pre-call. or the, you know. So, so we actually went through each and every patient. And, and uh, so basically, we spend our whole life in, in the hospital. And that's why, you know, once I sneak off to go to the bank and the, the bank clerk says, you work in the hospital. I say, how you know? You smell of the hospital. Okay. So I, I, I think that the only way you learn pediatrics is from patients. Okay. I'm not saying that uh, books are not important, but the only way is that you be with the patient, you see the difference, and you re begin to recognize that children are not like adults. They are not mini uh, adults. They can turn bad very fast. That's why we need three rounds a day. Eh? Because, they, you know, just between morning and evening, they can turn bad and die. So that, that is a very important lesson. And uh, I, I, uh, in my long experience uh, uh, as a pediatrician, I, I'm glad that I was involved both, I mean, being trained and as a trainer. So I was involved in some of the training programs. And uh, what are the things that uh, will help you to survive the training program? Okay, I mean, training program is tough. It's not a, a piece of cake, you know. And uh, we gripe and swear all the way, day and night. And we say, it's terrible. Like, who would want to be? Especially when you see your friends all, you know, graduating and having business and getting married. And you're still doing night calls. You know? And the worst thing is that at 2 a.m., you're trying to set drip on a baby that has no wings. You know, at least now you got ultrasound. Last time we did, we just shaved the baby. Uh, uh, uh new needs, huh? You you have to set the scalp weight. So I shaved the baby. Then after that, the mother said, "Very happy." Then give me ang pao some more. Yeah, uh, because Chinese you shave the head, they give you ang pao. But I I think the the yes we have to study, and I uh. No, and uh, during my time, I have study groups, and uh, during uh, my train, uh, train I when I train young uh, pediatricians, I make sure that they know their stuff. Okay, and basically, you need to know your stuff, and you need to know your latest journal, 
and you need to be able to know your patient. That means uh, uh, I'm quite demanding in the sense that every patient needs to be updated and you know your patient. You don't look at notes. When I do rounds, I insist that you don't look at notes. It should be at, uh, at your uh, fingertip already. So, yeah, I have basically is that you need to work hard. You need to be persistent. Okay. And to, to, to complete the training, you need to be stubborn. Stubborn and persistent. You, you make it. Lah. I think we can train a chimpanzee to be a pediatrician. That one is not a big issue. Okay. Just be stubborn enough to a chimpanzee. Mm. All right. Thank you, doctors. Mm. I totally agree that uh, you all say that patients are best teachers. I think this not only apply to pediatrician, it's, it, only, it also applies to like medicine in general. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Next up, the question, uh, are there any specific skills or qualities that you think are particularly important for success as a pediatrician? Dr. Lin? Uh, particular skills is that I feel that as a pediatrician, you probably must have good communication skills. I mean, for all the doctors, so particularly for children, because I find that you need to communicate with the child. You also need to communicate with the caretakers. So there's a lot of people that you need to communicate just to treat one child. It has to be the whole family thing. So one, the other thing is that I feel that the other one you also must be more creative and you must have uh, probably a little, a little bit of playfulness so that you can actually attract the child to interact with you and to approach you with, uh, how to say it, with, less, uh, with less fear. Because once they are scared, they will be crying a lot. Then you can't even examine them. So I feel that if the best thing is you must actually first do some bonding with the child, try to interact with them and bond with them. And the other thing is that, as you can see, children... Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. my, my child gets very slow. Dr. Alex, do you want to? Okay, Dr. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, so sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. Wait, wait, I don't know how to like, help. Okay. okay, sorry. Am I in? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so the other thing that I feel that is you must have a good observant skill, like observation skill. So I feel like if uh, a lot of times students cannot, you know, young babies cannot really talk. Some fathers probably cannot tell you well. The parent is not the child. And the parents are not the child themselves. So sometimes you ask the parents, they may not know exactly what the child is feeling too. So I feel that the inspection skills become very important in pediatrician, uh, in pediatrics compared to the adult. Because you probably need to observe and try to gain as, as much information as you can by just observing the child. So you need to be observant. And another skill that I thought probably is most of the pediatrician that I know are actually very meticulous. You have to be very meticulous on a lot of little, little information and even their social lives, uh, you know, the social history. So many, many small little details that you need to take because a child may not be able to express themselves well. So you need to know every single detail to make a proper diagnosis and to make a holistic kind of care for the child, I guess. And probably you have to be empathetic. You, have, you must have uh, empathy. Uh, you must have those kind of empathetic uh, character. Because a lot of times, when the child gets sick, the whole family are very sad. The parents are really sad. If you do not know how to feel for the parents and be empathetic for the parents, then your care for the child will not be complete if you cannot care for the parents as well. Because like, being a caretaker for the child, they need to be strong themselves to be able to take care of the child and give you the you know, the care that you hope that the mother can give. So I think at that point of time, you must also be able to so, sort of uh, stand at the perspective of the parent and feel safe. That's what I feel. Yeah, thank you. I think that is very good. It's very good. And also, you know, uh, if I'm asked to describe the characteristic, and actually uh, many parents and many people tell me, have told me about, you know, what are, uh, uh, the common characteristic of pediatricians is that they are gentle 
for one thing, and they are all OCD, you know, obsessive compulsive uh, people, because they are pay attention to details a lot. Okay, now if you ask me about skills, I say there are a lot of skills, and skills can be acquired. Okay, uh, how to deal with patient, how do you handle patient, and the what all all these things can be acquired, but you know, after all these years of looking back on my career, and uh, uh, if you ask me the the thing that I, I learned and wish that my younger self know, is that it's our attitude. Our attitude that these are patients, are people. Okay. You, you find that, you know, after you start working and in a busy clinic and in a busy hospital and the ward, every patient becomes a number. Every patient becomes a problem to be solved. Okay. So after a while, you don't uh, you say, oh, yeah, baby, what? No, we call them by their bed number. A bed 42, 42 needs a drip. You know, bed 31 needs a, a blood test. So, so that means we don't see them as people anymore. And if we don't see them as people, we don't treat them as people. So I, 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 that's one lesson I have to keep reminding me, especially you know when I start working and when I see a lot of patients and come under stress is that I'm dealing with people. I, they are not an interruption to my life. They are my life. Okay. So yes, I, I spend a lot of time acquiring skills on how to talk to patient, how to handle an irritable child, how to uh, make friends with the kids. Sometimes they haven't gone to the floor to play with the children, which is nice. I said I can't get up again, so the child will help, put, help you to get up. Okay, So yeah, skills can be learned, Okay, but the attitude must be acquired. All right, thank you, Dr. There's certainly something worth taking note of. So uh, kind of a follow-up from that question. So what are the main challenges and obstacles that pediatricians may face during their education or training or even working officially as a pediatrician? Dr. Alex? Sorry, uh, Dr. Think, Lee? Uh, which is me or Lee? Uh, Dr. Alex, you can, you can continue. Okay. I, I think the, the one of the main challenges is how do you handle stress? Okay, because being a pediatrician is very stressful because uh, you're dealing with uh, little people or little, little lives that can change very fast. So, so that means at the back of your mind is always worry. And I, I find that uh, people say leave your job at home, at work, and then you go home and you relax. I can't. Always at the back of the mind is that, did I make the right decision? Did I give the correct treatment? My fear is to get a call at midnight and say, oh, the patient you saw this morning uh, came back. Uh, and then I, I... So, so it's the stress. How do you, you have to learn to uh, unstress or distress yourself so that it doesn't destroy your life. Okay, because in, in the, we are talking about 20, 30, 40 years of work as a pediatrician. So, you know, that will, you will get hypertension, you get diabetes, you get heart, heart condition, and then all your, your body is all stressed out. So you get all sorts of things. So you need to be able to distress. That's one skill that you need. And the second is that you need to be able to plan to have time for your family, your husband or wife and your children. Okay. Do not let pediatrics be your whole life. That, that's a danger of, uh, you know, be, you'll be married to pediatrics, so to speak. That means you have no other life, no work-life balance, no time for exercise. The only exercise you have is uh, walking around the ward. That is not a life. Okay, so, so you have to be able to uh, inculcate some work-life balance. Okay, and of course, 
the third thing you always remember is that we are dealing with people. Dr. Lin? Okay. Yes, the challenges, like what Dr. Alex said, I guess it's a commitment, the commitment that you need to put in. Then you have to have a lot of discipline. Because as you prepare, like, you know, to, I guess during the time when I was preparing for my exam, during the part one was quite okay because at the time I was not married yet. So, uh, other than working, I go home, I got nothing to do. I just go exercise, come back, and then I just keep on practicing on my uh, preparing for my part one. You see, for preparing for part one, just now we mentioned about the exam, right? Uh, or just the tips and strategies, right? So preparing for part one, personally for me, I guess I cannot read book page to page. Very difficult. And so mm -hmm. I, in the end, I read, I was fall asleep. So what I do is I usually get a lot of exam questions. I get, either I get it online or I get it from my seniors. So I get a lot of these past year questions and I like to do I like to do the questions straight away. That means I don't read the chapter first. I just do it based on whatever I know, based on what I have seen in the world and based on whatever knowledge that I have. So I like to test myself. What I do is usually, I find that this works very well for me when I prepare for my 1A, 1B or 2A when it was a, a theory paper. Lah. So it said there are 30 questions. So I will, I will time myself and see how, how long do I need to finish these 30 questions. Then only I will mark myself and see what marks do I get before I study. So because as you do, then you realize, hey, actually, I thought I understand this question like this. Actually, my understanding is actually wrong. That's why I'm wrong. So then I go and read around the question. I personally find this very enlightening and very interesting. And it motivates me to do more questions. And the more I do, the better I become. And it, it really, really helped me. Like, so the, I wanted to get better and better marks next time. I think that I would do a pre and post. I mean, now I get this mark, I study around this question already. Then I will redo again this paper on my own and see how much do I get. So I find this uh, very, well, in terms of preparing for the theory exam. And then after that, uh, the problem comes when I actually start to sit for my 2B. When I sit for my 2A, I was married, but there was no children yet. So, you know, it's still okay. You can sit for the 2A. But then when the 2B came, when the child came, then it became a bit difficult because the baby is very young. And the baby, then my, my, the my boy was still breastfeeding. So, he, whenever I'm at home, he will come and then get stuck to me. Even though I try to lock him up from the room, he would then crawl outside oh, yeah. the room. Then he would, even though he's only like seven, eight months, he can only crawl. He would crawl to the outside of the door and then he would start banging the door. He knows that I'm inside. Oh, that's so difficult. <laughs> to sit for exam at that point of time. Um, so, I said, Actually, for that, for my for my two two B right, the clinical actually I didn't pass in my first attempt. I actually only passed in my second attempt. And of course, during the second attempt, uh, somehow that time, my my child and my husband, my husband has to go. Uh, he has to go for his master training in KL or so lah. So at that point, we sort of uh, separated for a while. So he brought my son to KL where my in laws are. So I was alone. Ah, because now I'm alone back. <laughs> I beg to be alone. I have more time to <laughs> focus on studying, working, and come back and study on my own. Then, of course, for the part 2B exam, the, the other tips to pass it is you must really also do a lot of short case practice with your friends and with your seniors and with your bosses. And, you know, it actually helps. At that point when I was in when I prepare for the second time, when I have more time, first you also need to read. You have you must have enough knowledge to apply it as you see the patient. Now. So the first time when my son was around was really difficult to even study enough for me to have enough information for me to feel confident. Even though, if you don't read enough, the confidence is not there when you see the patient. You feel that you may need something. Your your diagnostic process may not be complete because you don't have enough to consider. So, so finally, I have enough to, to read, but I need to practice because application of the knowledge cannot come when you do not see the patient. You may think whatever you read, read, read and memorize, when I see this, I must say this, 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 I must look for this, this, this. But the more you see patient, if you don't practice it, the thing cannot come out at that moment when you see the patient. Right? Mm -hmm. So at that point when I was, uh, I, what I find helpful is the time, the time when I was, was about to sit for exam, no one else was Sitting for exam at some point, nobody is interested to do the short case thing together with me. So sometimes I do it with Dr. Nim, ah, your, your lecturer. So sometimes she's very kind, she did it together with me. 
uh, she helped me. And then I actually arranged, because when I set for my first, uh, first attempt, I got to know a few friends during the exam. So they also faced the same difficulty as me, where in their hospital, they also do not have friends who were sitting for exams at the same time. They don't have enough uh, friends to practice with them. So I sort of lied with the friend, the newfound friend that I have. She is from Malacca. Then both of us, both, both of us tried to find a time that we would we would actually take leave. Then both of us will go to Kuala Lumpur. Because in KL, there were more cases. In Johor Bahru, I mean, in HSA, there's a lot of patients, but then we don't have a proper, they don't have a very specialized kind of specialty for you to have enough uh, exposure. That's what I feel. Right? So that time, me and her, we actually took some leave. On and off, we will arrange some leave. We actually go to HKL only for one or uh, five days, and then we arrange for three days or four days. Then we will go to the PIT Institute. The so both of us will just go from ward to ward. We get permission from the specialist in charge of the ward herself because we, we actually write a letter, formal letter to the HKL Pengara and then also inform the head of department. Then after that, we actually go from ward to ward for the two, three days. We also go to IJN to see many different types of uh, heart patients. And actually, I find that it really works. As I see more patients do so much short cases, the second attempt, during the second attempt, I feel so much more confident. And at one point also, I also have to change my mindset. See, during the first mindset, I feel that I am still like a student. I have not passed my exam, and now I, I'm a candidate sitting for exam. But then I finally I realized, actually, this mindset is totally wrong. My mindset should be, I am a specialist. Why am I so scared sitting for the exam? Because the first exam was so nervous. But the, during the second exam, I told myself, if I pass this exam, I'm going to be accepted as a specialist. If I cannot see myself as a specialist and, and you know, and talk to the patient confident as a specialist, you will never, I will never pass one because if you cannot think, you don't believe in yourself, sure, you cannot pass one. So, so every time when I see patient in the ward, I will tell myself, if I am the specialist, what would I do to this patient? What would the management be? So as I, as I do this, before the exam, I became more and more confident. So when I go for the exam, I will tell myself, this is just another round that I'm doing. If I, I mean, during work also, you'll be, I'm already working as a senior, senior MO. Man. So a lot of times, if a specialist trusts you, sometimes the round basically is actually done by the senior MO, then you just have to inform the specialist what have you done. Then they just endorse it, okay, follow your plan. So at that point of time, when I do it, I can tell myself, it is just another round that I'm doing. I just have to do my best and you know give the best uh, care to the patient that I'm seeing this is not an exam the patient in the exam is also the patient in my daily in my daily life it's just it's a different setting so why am I so scared you want to be scared just go in and pretend that this is my round and I'm just doing round that's it so the the second exam actually went very well I came out knowing that I think I will pass I have a feeling that more than more than eighty percent of the time, I think I will pass. So I really so just so that that's it. Um, wait, 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 I think I have deviated. What was the topic again? <laughs> uh, any challenges and obstacles? Oh, challenges, yeah, the obstacle. So the commitment is there, and so this one I don't know how to how to solve this problem. I have a few friends who managed to get, uh, you know, they have become a pediatrician. Subsequently, they want to do their subspecialty training. I have a few friends who actually quit halfway again because of the family commitment. Because more children will come out already. I mean, after they're all females. <laughs> <la. laughs> so they cannot go through the whole specialty training because that's another stress coming in. In the beginning, you probably have one or two uh, children. So as they go along, maybe have more children than the children start to go to school, the other commitments coming in. So a lot of them actually, a lot, like a few of them actually quit halfway in the specialty commitment. It's actually one of the challenges that you will face as you go for your training. The dedication, whether can you actually do, if you have good, very good social support, even though you are married and have children, if you have good social support, then I think it is still doable. But if you don't, like in my case, it was difficult because my parents like are uh, like probably in Sarawak, then my in laws are actually in KL. So there's actually no one to really take care of the children. So a bit difficult to really pursue until the top specialty. For me, and I, I guess it becomes a choice between either me or my husband going do because my husband do better than I do it. So after he like I let him do and I don't I just uh, stay as a general pediatrician. So commitment is one of it and the stress law. So see how you want to divide your time and what is your priority already at the point of time. Mm. 
Okay, thank you, Doctor, for sharing your experience. It's all in the mindset, I guess. Okay, uh, the next is it may be this question may be interesting for some of us here. So are there any particular subspecialties within pediatrics that are growing in demand or offer unique career opportunities? Dr. Alex? Well, if you want to make money, don't be a pediatrician. Okay, pediatricians are very poor people. You know, people who make money are the neurosurgeons, the cardiologists, you know, cardiothoracic surgeon, the surgeons. Okay, because pediatrics is a non procedure. That means you don't do procedures. Okay, one procedure can, uh, you know, you will be paid $10,000 or more for a procedure. Pediatrics, we don't do procedure. Okay, we only set drips. Okay, and uh, you can't charge much for setting drips. So, so uh, the question is, uh, which discipline you can make more money? I can't think of any. Huh? Dim, do you have any uh, advice for people who want to make money? Not necessarily making money. Like, there's any, any discipline that within pediatrics they are in demand, like now. Or in the field, in the near future. Probably most of the fields in pediatrics will still be in demand. Because I actually read in that the pencil also, there are still pediatricians are still, still lacking in the country. Right? Let, let me see. Uh, I share the screen again. I think I actually wrote it out. Okay, let me see. Where was it? Ah, here. Okay. <laughs> So that's what I get the statistics from like an outline. So they say in 2020, right, there were 1,200 pediatricians registered with the NSR1. But then their target is by 2030, they want to have one pediatrician to 5,850 children. But then, so they calculated, they foresee, right, if in 2030, there will be 36.8 million population where 30% is below 18. So you will need about 2,025 children. So you actually feel Lacking, right? So if you ask which field, I guess no matter which field in pediatrics, there will still have place for you to go to. <laughs> now, but perhaps generally what I feel, the field that is uh, in demand, I don't know whether, whether Alex agree with me, because I see a lot of children with developmental issues in my clinic. And I believe it's the same with other clinics. I think so. Lah, huh? And I feel very sad for them because their issues are something that is not just uh, you cannot solve the issues with giving medication. If you can, it will be so much easier, right? But their problem is very long-lasting and very chronic, and there's no medication to solve it. And the improvement is very subtle, and the improvement needs a lot of time and effort from the caretaker. It's really on the right. They need specific therapy. They need special education, but they are also lacking I believe not just in Johor, I believe it's the whole country. And, and then the other thing is a special education for this group of children are also very lacking. Some of the mother asked me, where should I go? Well, actually not many schools that I know of can actually, you know, accommodate children which are, which are actually in this category. But I feel that in this developmental field seems to be a field that is, I personally think is in demand. But in terms of uh, whether making money, I also don't know, maybe not really, lah, huh? because you need to spend <laughs> a lot of time. <laughs> it's a that you need to spend so much time with the child and with the mother, with the parents, with the caretaker. Yeah. But definitely I believe it is in demand. It's just that whether any a lot of people want to do want to delve into this field or not. And then talking about making money, I also personally feel pediatric is not a field for you to make money. And so really, the making money is that those people do ophthalmology, right, Dr. Alex? The yep. procedure very fast, very simple. <laughs> you can actually, it, it can, usually in private, when you charge, the charging, the high charges one will come from procedure. And those simple, fast procedures are the ones that can make you earn a lot of money. And so really, I feel that ophthalmology it's probably another one lucrative field, and you don't need so much time standing there doing long, long operations like those neurosurgeons. They maybe make money, they can't thoracic, but they need to stand very long. The operation very long and they're very complicated. So I personally feel maybe outcome surgery will be good. Sounds terrible, I will. Talk about money. Yes. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah. doctors. So I mm. think like pediatrician is a is a field that is, it might not reward you in terms of money, but it yeah. will reward, reward you in terms of your experience. Right. Uh, yeah, we we do it, we love. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You must have passion for children. If you love children, it is actually a very enjoyable um career. Actually, I enjoy I enjoy pediatrics because I enjoy working with the children. So it is still rewarding, even though the money went back. Is that rewarding? <laughs> but it is still a rewarding thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, shall we proceed to the next question? So as you know, uh, work-life balance has always been a hot topic, especially in the newer generation when it comes to career choices. So could doctors you all share some insights to the work-life balance for pediatricians and how they manage their professional and personal lives? Dr. Alex? Well, I think uh, work-life balance is uh, something that uh, recently has become a major issue. I mean, as I said, uh, in my early years as a pediatrician, there's actually no emphasis and uh, no uh, government sympathy to us. When you talk about, oh, I want time to, to spend with my family, they, they will ask you to resign. Okay, they have no sympathy, you know, either that or you take no pay leave if you're judged. Okay, at least now uh, they are more sympathetic and I see that uh, they have allowed uh, more leave and, uh, you know, for even for house officers and MOs, they're doing shift, shift work. And shift work is actually allows you more time. So uh, then uh, the consultants are not so demanding, so you don't have to attend three rounds a day, so to speak. So there are more opportunities, but still not enough. I think there should be more uh, opportunities for to balance the work life. Okay. Uh, Alim, what do you think? Yes, I believe life has gotten better and better for the newer generation doctors. Lah. So, so during Dr. Alex time, you do round three times in a day, regardless whether you're on call or not. Also, you can only go home after 9 p.m. Eh? During my time, not so bad. <laughs> Unless we are on call, we can actually go home uh, after 5. Uh, by 5, that is also provided if there's no UK. Lah. Not everything mm. has started, then we go home. So, and that time, because during on call time, my, I, I, your time must be real worse. Like. During my time, if you have very bad on call, I also find it very tiring and quite exhausting. Because <laughs> with that means you have to work 36 hours a day. Eh. If you go to work at, at 7 o'clock to go take blood, take blood, take blood, 8 o'clock, you start your run with your MO. Then you finish your work, but you continue on call. If your on call is bad, the whole night being called, the whole night cannot sleep. Then the next day you have to be up at work again. And then by 5, only you can go home. Then you can go and sleep. That's really tiring. <laughs> So, and then, right, during that time, the only motivation to make me want to become a specialist fast is really because I don't want to do the on-call anymore. It's just <laughs> I thought, yes, if you become a specialist, right, then probably, if especially you also do on-call, but your on-call will not be as bad. I don't say, like, yeah. at least you have, if you have trustworthy MOs, that means uh, you can actually give some, sometimes you can give some verbal kind of instruct, uh, instruction. You, you will definitely come and see and make sure that the patients are stable. Once I know the patients are stable, I know the patients that you can go home and then subsequently the MO will help you to settle. Uh, and you, if you trust the MO, you know the MO can actually do what you ask them to do. So the life becomes better in that sense. So that's motivated a lot of my friends during my time. Most of my friends want to become specialists fast because we all don't want to do the MO call so much. <laughs> That's true. It's that's like, true. It's like a torture. <laughs> yeah. So so you literally have to fight uh to to balance your life. As uh, yeah. especially to fight to get time for your family and your spouse. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's one you really have to to push back because uh the I mean last time uh a unit will have two or three MOs. So that means you're doing EOD calls, you know. Mm, Not yeah, like yeah. now, 30 MOs. Yeah. Uh, the, no. the calls are a lot. Like, yeah, I was <laughs> like, uh, how many calls you got this month? I think 16 calls. Uh, you know, that's half the month. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Very scary. So, <laughs> yeah, so how do you have a, a, a work life balance uh, when you're doing 16 yeah. calls? <laughs> 
you are very difficult already. So of course, once you are free out of the call, out of the work, uh, then go and bonding with your friends and bonding with your family. But then I guess between uh female and male, probably that's a difference in how to do that. Like because you're for men, people rec- the society recognizes men as the, the breadwinner of the family. So that means you must make a decision where you have to go to the field. Or at least if you're still in the pediatrics, you probably still have to opt to go to the hospital pediatrics where the you can actually earn in a way earn better than the clinic pediatrics. Huh? But mm. because as a female, so actually before I came out from the government service, uh, I actually did a few locums with uh, the doctors outside. So I have done a few hospital, uh, private hospital locum, and I also have helped uh, one or two clinic pediatric locum. Mm. And at that point, and I realized, wow, actually it's not easy to work in the private hospital as pediatrician. Because suddenly, right, once you are used to the life in the government hospital, you have MOs, you have senior registrar, a lot of people underneath to carry out your plan. <laughs> then when you put and become the private hospital pediatrician, all of a sudden you are the houseman, you are the MO, you are the specialist, sometimes you are the nurse, because if you cannot trust the nurse, come the nursing job, probably you also have to do to make sure that the child is really safe. So I thought, wow, this is a little bit too tiring. And suddenly you, you have to do everything like, as a private pediatrician. Then, then if you do the hospital work, you have to go back to do the on-call again. Then the on-call again, it may not have as many patients as you have in government hospital, but then you just have two patients, one come at 11 p.m., one come at 3 a.m., but you already one whole night, you need to really sleep ready. So I, I find that, oh, this life, I really don't like this life. And at that time, I, I have two children at this, so I feel no good. If I really come out and work as a hospital pediatric uh, pediatrician, I will really have no time to take care of my children. <laughs> so that's why I decided if I ever come out, I think I will just do <laughs> pediatrics so that my time is flexible. I can set my own time. Uh, you can operate at your own time. It just depends on how much you want to earn. So you set your own limit. You make your own choice. You want to earn more money, of course, you can run longer hours. If you prefer, if you feel that your priority is your family, then you just have to set a time that is suitable for your uh, family, you know, the running of your family life. So at that point of time, also, I came out that my husband has, started, uh, has actually applied and gotten his master program. So the moment he go in, I know that we cannot keep on, because he has to change from hospital to hospital during the training. And it is very difficult to get transferred immediately from the MOH. So it says it's not easy to get the transfer. So I feel that the only way that I have to come out, then only the life can be fixed and stable. That's why I came out and opened this clinic. And my clinic time, that time will follow my children's study time. They, so they go to school, I go to work. They come back from school, I also come back from clinic. Yeah. So of course, if you think about it, that means my income will not be as much as much I have comfortable pay, but it won't be very rich kind of uh, lifestyle. Like. But I feel that it's okay like, because uh, this is what I have, uh, this is the choice that I've made. Like. So in terms of work life, I believe I probably do have a work life balance. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Dr. Alex does know what, probably not so much money. I do have work and I do have to be huh? well, Dr. Alex is different. <laughs> no, not really, but uh, let me not discourage you. We do earn a comfortable income. Okay, <laughs> We are not really starving at this moment. But uh, in private, usually we get patients that come about uh, about 10, o'clock, 10 p.m. Okay. That's, that's a time when, you know, after dinner, the family is uh, washed up already. Then they say, oh, the kid is sick. Let's go and see the, the pediatrician. So they will turn up about 10 p.m., and then the next batch will be about 3 a.m. Is that those who say, oh, we don't want to see the doctor at midnight. You know, the doctor charge double. Day. Then the kid could become worse. So they come at 3 a.m. So these are the two peak periods that will disturb you at night. Ah, this, but Dr. This. Alex, you are still strong. Huh? I find that oh, waking up in the, in the night after 12 at night, very tiring the next day, right? But not enough. <laughs> no, enough as a G. Yeah, you're very strong at the toilet. <laughs> okay, thank you, doctors, for your sharing. So I guess like how how Dr. Lim managed is like uh your career choices is 
dependent on what your priority at that point in life, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, so I, the... I, I, I think that the, it, it, different situation have different answers, especially if your spouse is also planning to be a specialist and uh, it, easier in the okay. one sense, but in another sense is that if your spouse is not a doctor, that becomes a more issue because a spouse cannot understand why are you working so hard? Why are you spending so much time away? So I think it's a life situation that, you know, there's no one size fit everything. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, as we, as we mentioned just now, pediatrics is some... Uh, is a field that it's rewarding in terms of experience and it's memorable. So can both doctors share any of them, like memorable or rewarding experiences that you have had as a pediatrician that reaffirm your career choices? Dr. Lee? Um, okay. I probably have two, two stories to share. The first one was when I was a junior MO. I was a like first year MO in pediatrics. But that incident uh, almost the incident was the incident when I told myself if the child survived, then I will continue as in my pediatric career. If the child did not survive, I think I would just quit my career as pediatric. I won't even go into it anymore. It was actually a I think about four or five years old child who came in with uh, low bar pneumonia and pleural infusion. Then I think my specialist asked me to get some pleural fluid shampoo. So when the child was the kidney on oxygen, but the child was otherwise stable in the general ward. But when I did the plural, um, the plural tap. Uh, I guess uh, this is how the time me and my, my another colleague, we didn't use, uh, usually my mom especially taught us to use the granula and then use it. But at that time, we didn't use the granula. I don't know what happened to both of us. We decided that we want to use the butterfly. We thought the butterfly seems to be a little bit gentler. But actually, it's more dangerous. And because it's not too young, right? It just thought, wow, the granula size looks so big. Maybe it'll be more dangerous. The, the butterfly looks so small, maybe safer. But the butterfly, because it's a middle, ma, so while we are doing that, uh, we actually, we definitely have actually pricked certain, uh, some blood vessels. And the child actually turned from just the kidney alone, become really the kidney and really go into distress after like probably two, three hours. Because the child developed, on top of the pleural effusion, the child developed hemothorax. So the child has to be ventilated, has to be incubated and went to the ICU. At that point, I was really guilty. The guilt was so much, right? I felt that before I did the pleural tap, the child, even though the kidney, but the child was stable. Well, after my procedure, the child turned so unstable, oh had to God. be intubated. and go to ICU. Well, the kind of uh, guilt that I have was so intense. I didn't even, that, time, that day, actually, I was not on call. I didn't even I didn't even go home because I felt so bad for the child. So I stayed with my specialist. I went to ICU together with my specialist and, and watched him until he was stabilized. Then only I went home probably about 9 p.m. When I went home, I couldn't even eat my dinner because I was really so upset with myself. So sad and so guilty. Just went straight away to sleep. I didn't sleep. But I, I mean, I couldn't really sleep also. So at that point of time, I think and think and think. I told myself, I prayed to God. I told God, God, if it is your will that I continue as a pediatrician and let this child survive, <laughs> bless this child and let the child survive. But if, if, if the child really, if it is your will, the child couldn't survive, then I guess I'm actually not fit to be a pediatrician. That was, that was my thought at the point of time. So I went back to the hospital the next day and went and have a look at the child. I thought, because the child, okay, now you see that I become a pediatrician <laughs> because, the child, <laughs> because the child really became better and better. The child came out of ICU, so the child went back to the general ward. And finally, the child actually walked back home happily. So I feel, wow, okay. <laughs> that is a sign that God gave me something to become a pediatrician. So that was the first a memorable experience I never forget that because it was at that point it became a decision making kind of uh, a decision making point. I may actually really quit if the child really like that. So that was one. The second rewarding experience was I was already a practicing pediatrician. That time I was taking care of the pediatric ICU in HSA. So over the weekend, there was one child, about one year old, came in with severe adenovirus infection. So he had very bad, the lungs was uh, really, 
very, very severe kind of uh, inflammation within the lungs and the child made a very high setting on, on the ventilator. So over the weekend, the, the specialist who saw the child told a very, uh, kind of, very grave prognosis uh, to the parents, uh, told them that the child may not survive. The parents were really upset. So I came back on Monday to take over. Uh, I took my camera to my own ward. Right? So when I saw the child, even though on very high setting, the saturation, the highest that he can go is probably 80% only. Despite very high setting, had to use the, I think, too long out of the picture. <laughs> the the <laughs> white setting, <laughs> the kind of setting where you have to like, continue to like, hit the lungs. <laughs> so, but because I saw the progress from weekend until now, even though it's only about 80 to 85% the men, but I see improvement that the child showed comparing for what the child had on Saturday, uh, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and now Monday when I saw, there was an improvement. So in there, I told the parents, it, of course, the condition may not seem, uh, the condition, the child, your, your child may not be very stable now, but the child is actually showing improvement. So I told the parents, I showed them that, you know, from here, the child has become like this. Then after that, I told the parents, I would, we will try our best. I mean, our whole team will be like you. We will try our best to save your child. But of course, I cannot promise you anything. But the good thing, that I, the good news I can tell you is that I see progress. I see that he is making good progress. Hopefully, this progress can continue. But that actually gave some hope to the parents. I don't know whether it is right or wrong to do that. But then the parents were very happy at that point of time because finally they see hope. I guess from very dark cloud, suddenly soon, someone said that there's some hope. There's like a ray of hope from just. Then we took care of the child. Along the way, there's a lot of uh, up and down of the child's condition. The child just stayed with us in PSU for how many months? I think it's nearly two months eh, before finally the child can come out from the, but finally the child came out like, from the ventilator. We managed to somehow save the child. The child came out from the ventilator. Along the way, there's a multiple chest tube insertion for pneumothorax, the la, pure effusion. La. So, so many things happening. The, the then got not so common. But uh, every time the child managed to somehow come up from the crisis. He just take good care of the, uh, the patient. And finally, the child, after he stayed in the hospital for almost four, I cannot remember, I think, four or five months. The child now is about 11. He's now about 11 years old. Already. So the child finally survived and came out from ICU and he discovered from his severe adenome virus bronchiolitis to be, so he actually developed bronchiolitis of the in end. Mm. That's why for multiple pneumothorax. Okay. Uh, and he had very bad fibrosis. He needed us uh, particularly. He was on oxygen for quite a period of time before we can bring him off and send him home. Back. Finally, he went home. That was a very rewarding experience. The parents were very, very thankful. And they were very thankful for a long period of time. The, pa the father was like a farmer like that. So on and <laughs> off, right? <laughs> Even though the child left the hospital already discharged, he was on and off bringing vegetables, and fruit and bring to peace and you for all of us. Actually, we also felt very happy when you see him. Like, it's like, you know, the kind of, uh, how to say, uh, not to not say because we see the fruit, but we're happy. Like, it's like, like, someone actually appreciates your efforts and they really see how to say. It feels very rewarding to see parents appreciating the effort that you put in their child. Also, when I do it, I don't do it for the intention of giving, getting some reward back or anything. You just want to save the child because the child He's your patient. I just want to save him. I, I really want, to, I really hope that he can really come out and go home. And finally, he did. So the parents were very thankful for a very prolonged, on and off, right? When they come, but subsequently, after I left the clinic, they actually came out. They were follow up under Dr. Asya and the respiratory pediatric, uh, pediatrician in the hospital. But subsequently, they realized that I've come out to the private. They, in the end, they also came. They came, whenever the child has a problem, they came back and looked for me in my clinic. But every time when they come, he will come and bring. His, uh, what is it, papaya la. <laughs> then got the vegetables la. Then I can feel wow the uh how to say he always tell me that he felt that I'm like a savior of his child like that. She's like, uh, she not really it's actually God to save your child, la, huh? Because I just do my part as the doctor and that I just believe that the child still has a lot chance of survival that we cannot just give up just because uh, it looks a bit bleak. Of the chances of survival, it's still there, my so we just have to try our best. So that again, and the child is now 11 years old, he's quite okay now. Like, he, he doesn't really need to use the MBI anymore, he's actually going well. Like. Mm. So, uh, this is another rewarding experience during my pediatric career. Like. Yeah, like that. <laughs> How about you, Dr. Alex? Well, 
uh, quite a number of, uh, I mean, a lot of, most of them are very rewarding. But the one I always remember is that uh, it's a premature baby. Okay. Uh, 22 weeks, 400 grams. You know, 400 grams will fit into my uh, feet. You know? Okay. So, uh, as usual, went through everything uh, because we don't have surfactant at that time. So we were ventilating the child you know, and we were using the high frequency ventilation, high pressure approach. And uh, the, everything you, you, you mentioned, this little fellow will get you know, internal ventricular hemorrhage, uh, PDA, and uh, it gave me hell for three months. In three months, I, I almost. Uh, I actually literally stay in the I, in ICU, you know, take blood, morning blood sample, afternoon blood sample. Oh, child anemic, give blood, and then take some more blood, you know. So, 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 but surprisingly, he survived. He survived, and then he was uh, on ventilator for almost uh, four months. Then after that, uh, it was a, uh, a, uh, uh, very interesting that he did not have any uh, uh, fiscal or mental deficit. No, I mean, it, 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 I, I always tell the mother, hey, this is a miracle child. I don't know how how he did it. And uh, inside, I know that is, there's no way I can save such a kid. But he, he did well. And then uh, I would see him now and then. Uh, uh, other than my the follow up, that I'll meet him in the shopping center, and then he see me from afar. He run and give me a hug, and then the mother say, "Hey, this doctor saved your life, you know." And then he look at me. He, he, I don't think he understand what it means, but yeah. But uh, today he is a professor of medicine, you know. So so, I thought, hey, yeah, not bad, ah, uh, four hundred grammar can be professor of medicine. That's, that's oh, one. Oh, that's... 22 weeker, very good, eh, Dr. Alex. You yeah. feel your survival very bad, like 400 grams. I know. I mean, I read all the <laughs> wow. books. Uh, he got stage 4 IVH also. You know? Wow. So, uh, really miracle, I... home. I know. You have taken good care of him. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's not my what, but, you know, but can be professor of, of medicine. Uh, not too bad. Oh. Uh. Where is he now? Which hospital? Uh, Which university? Melbourne. Oh wow! So good. Does he come back and see you? Uh, not recently. Not recently. But mm. I mean, uh, we don't. Our path won't cross anymore. Of it. After he <laughs> went for uh uh to to Melbourne, he didn't come back so much. Mm. Okay. The, the the other one was uh that always I always remember is uh, a child that is born with uh hypoxic uh encephalopathy normal birth, but uh, was hypoxic because of uh, a delayed second stage, uh, shoulder dystocia. So uh, it, took, it took about half an hour to get him out, but the child was cerebral, uh, terrible uh, cerebral palsy. And uh, the mother was very good. The mother uh, slowly learned, we teach her how to uh, take care of the child. The child was totally dependent. And, and uh, it's, uh, later on, they will have a flexion and all that. Totally uh, global delay. Can't even uh, talk, can't even respond. And uh, the, the mother will take very good care. And then every time he has an upper respiratory tract infection or, or a lot of secretion, he'll bring to see me in my clinic. And we did that for 14 years. Okay. And I always really respect the mother. You know, taking care of this child for 14 years, you know, and because of a good care, the child survived. So, unfortunately, uh, when the child was 14 years old, she delivered a, a aspiration pneumonia and then she died. And I can always remember that uh, I actually went to her funeral and I cried. And the mother says, Doc, no, don't cry. She gave us 14 good years. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate that the experience of looking after this child. Yeah. So I still get a bit teared up when I, I 
I shared it. Yeah, these are our experience. Okay, thank you, doctors, for sharing. Uh, I think the children are actually very lucky to have you all taking care of them. So that was certainly an insightful point of view from both our speakers. So now we'll be having a break, five minutes. So uh, to all audiences, audiences on Zoom, you can continue posting your questions on Slido and we shall meet at 5.30. So I see uh, we have some questions here. So we shall begin with, with our Q&A session. Uh, Dr. Lim, are you there? Yep, we are still here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lim, you are muted. Ah, oh, yes. Okay. Okay, so let's begin with our first question from the floor. Uh, will the participants have access to the recording and slides? So they are asking, whether we are, we are willing to share with them they are, uh, this recording and Dr. Lim's slides. Okay. The slides are okay. You can share the slides. All right. Thank you, Dr. So the next one is, have you considered being a pediatric surgeon? Is the pathway as a pediatric surgeon similar to a pediatrician? Dr. Lim? Uh, it's different. It's different. I think the pediatric surgeon you have to first. I don't know whether it's true. Like, I I think they become a surgeon first. They're not need to become a pediatric surgeon. Is it the select? Or do they do they have a field that they can go straight, like the neurosurgery? Like? I, I think now it's a straight uh, discipline. They don't straight go to a uh, just last time in the past, yes. In the uh, past, in the uh, uh, pediatric surgery, surgery is a sub subspecialty. Sub yeah, now, uh, but no now they have go they go straight. Uh, under, the surgical, under the surgical yeah. few and so they was they definitely have to go through the master. Yeah. So, so no parallel pathway for uh, pediatric surgery. I, I think uh pediatric surgery and pediatrician are two different uh disciplines. Mm. Okay. I mean uh one is medical, one is surgical. So yeah. I think the whole whole discussion is different. All right. The next one we have is, would the doctors know about the pathway as a pediatrician in Australia or UK? Uh, even a rough, gut, rough outline will do. The yeah, Dr. Alex, Alex, do you know? Do you know, Alex? Yeah, I have to go and search for it. They're not too sure. Like, I have to ask okay. around. Mm. Because they get the uh, FRACP. Or do they have a specialist now? Yeah, so I, I no, I don't I don't think we know. I know. Oh, okay. It's okay. So the next one, are we able to complete all the entrance exams during housemanship? Like for the four years minimum clinical training, can it be started once we become a MO? Yes, you can because the part one exam, you can take it any time that you want. Anna. There is uh, then, but the, the thing is that before you can enter into the four years, you must still complete your housemanship training and you must have the MMC registration and you also must uh, have at least the four months of houseman uh, uh, training in the pediatric posting. Huh? So you can actually take the exam first, even though you have not completed the whole thing, but you can always take the exam maybe. Mm. So that once you're ready, your MMC is done, your four months pediatric posting is done, then you can straight away try to get into the uh, program ready. Mm. All right, thank you, Dr. Lim. So I'll address the next one to Dr. Alex. Would you recommend being a pediatrician in Malaysia or would being in overseas or being overseas be a better option? Well, I, I would uh, advocate being a pediatrician anywhere in the world. Okay, because yeah, Wherever you, wherever you are, you are still a pediatrician. Okay, you look after children, you care for them, you worry about them, and you do things for them. Okay, so you give uh, them the benefit of your expertise and you help them. So if you if the question in general is that does it make a difference being a pediatrician in Malaysia, Australia, US? No. Okay, we do the same thing. It's just that environment is different. Okay, so, you know, 
uh, is like you drive a car uh, on the left side of the road in uh, Malaysia and then you drive on the right side of the road in uh, uh, Germany. So it's environment and circumstance. That's very true, Dr. Alex. Mm -hmm. So the next one we have is, what are the difficulties that pediatricians face that are different from the other specialists? Maybe to Dr. Lee? Let me think how to answer <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, a so yeah. it's a trick question. It's a trick question. I guess difficult to answer because of, we have not worked in other fields. How would I know what kind of difficulty you there have? And then if this field is something that I have been working after a while, you get used to this working environment and this kind of working skills that is really needed. I also don't know what kind of difficulty that is different. Eh? What do you think of that, Alex? Well, I, I think for one is that uh, we are dealing with uh, our patients who cannot speak, cannot tell us what okay. to do. So yeah. the nearest I can, uh, I always tell my grandchildren that pediatrics is like doing veterinary so uh, medicine. No, uh, uh, you're dealing with uh, dogs and cats that cannot talk to you, but we learn to observe and, and learn to treat. So I think that's the difference. That's the major difference, especially when you're dealing with uh, younger children. Of course, uh, now that uh, our pediatrics have uh, expanded to adolescent medicine and all that, so we do uh, deal with patients who can talk to us. But I think the major difference is that we are dealing with uh, younger people and uh, the, uh, these younger people are not able to speak from in the beginning. Mm. Yeah. What about in terms of work-life balance? Is it very different from the other specialists or how would you rate uh, the work-life balance in pediatrics? Let's say working in the hospital. Yeah. Feel you better than certain fields, probably in the middle, <laughs> like not too bad and not too good. Okay, I don't know how to say. It. I guess if you compare to all engineers, orange will be worse, right? Personally, too close. <laughs> then, uh, compared to who? Then I guess you compare to, let's see, like probably ENT, ophthalmo. Then would they have less emergency if they were in the hospital in a way? Then probably less, uh, less time disturbed at night. In a way, do you think so? Yeah. So, probably in terms of work life balance, it's not too bad la, in, for pediatric. Mm. Would that be fair to say so <laughs> if I'm not working in the hospital side? Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. It, because pediatric is not homogeneous. Because you have pediatrician working in hospitals, in intensive care, then in clinics, in family practice, public health. So, uh, there's a wide range, is it? So it's difficult to say, uh, yes, uh, work-life balance is uh, good or bad. But if we uh, look at the indirect indicators, for example, the which discipline has the highest suicide rate? Okay, because those are the most stressful ones. Okay, now pediatrics have the, the least suicide rate. Which means that, uh, and if uh, in a st study done in the States, the happiest uh, doctors are the pediatricians. So take that. And, and I think we have a good life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, our patients also make us happy. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, hmm. Some yeah, children are very really adorable. And... Yep. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that will be a good answer, yeah? Yeah, yeah, correct. Very good. <laughs> okay, thank you, doctors. So what are the most common diseases you see in the pediatric ward? Mm, Dr. Alex? Alex? Well, I mean, the uh, commonest is infectious diseases. I mean, we still, number one, uh, no, uh, respiratory in infection, uh, we still the top lah. In terms of what then dengue and all this still infectious disease, okay. But depending in the uh, when you say hospital, depending on what type of hospital you have, primary care, secondary care, tertiary care. 
So if you are talking about like uh, KBJ uh, Jaw Specialist Hospital, okay, and uh, uh, KBJ Putri Specialist Hospital, th these are considered tertiary private hospitals. That means we get all the uh, very severely ill children. Okay, so so uh, uh, that means we get uh, the ref ref uh, referred cases. So what we see will be different from a, a community hospital, which will see uh, different things. So it's uh, so when you ask a question like, what's the commonness? You have to specify what type of hospital. Right? You know, hospital setting are different. Uh, so so we see different. I mean, if you have a, a, a because like Putri specialist hospital is a private hospital, but we we have a uh, I mean, uh, neonatologist and a neurologist. So you see more uh, neuro cases there. Okay, so your specialist, we have uh, 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 facilities for cardiac lab and all that. So we see a bit more cardiac and other subspecialty things. Okay, okay. I, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think it really depends on which area that you work in as well. Because I don't know whether what that means private hospital or government hospital. Then even government hospital, government hospital in different states, different uh, city may see um different types of uh, diseases. Because uh, the, the patients that I see in Sarawak the last time, some of the patients that I see, I don't really see in Johor Bahru. Right? Uh, just say like a hand foot mouth like that. The hand foot mouth disease that time in Cebu when we had the outbreak, oh, yeah. it was really bad. It was really, mm. really bad. And the hand foot mouth uh, disease in Sarawak, there will be probably at least 10% are really life threatening that need ICU care. They actually go into shock. So, whereas in Johor Bahru, after having so many years in Johor Bahru, none of the case is life threatening, none at all. Eh? So, so the, the, the cases, the epidemiology is just different. Then, uh, like, probably like rheumatic heart disease, somehow in that time back in hospital, Cebu, I still see quite a lot. Then over here, actually, not many also in Johor Bahru. So, the, it's a, the, the, the type of cases may differ according to the places that you work in, also. Mm. Yeah, I remember the outbreak, you know, the hand, foot, and mouth outbreak. Yeah, uh, very bad, really yeah. bad. <laughs> we were all in high, high alert in JB, you know, oh. so we grabbed every hand, foot, and mouth and admit and. Uh, uh, helps. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah we, yeah. we actually have a what just for handful mouth on it and can be full every day. So, one. Yeah, so but uh thank thankfully we don't have any. Nah. It is just uh, like during the the uh what period the coronavirus uh, yeah, during yeah. the outbreak. Mm. Mm, yeah, mm. different different uh Environment. Yeah, yeah. We always say that you know they don't have passport to cross the crossway. <laughs> I think it all depends on the epidemiology and also the facilities, the health the healthcare facilities that the center has. So uh, are there any tips to breaking bad news to parents and be emotionally detached from really sad cases that we may handle? Dr. Alex, you want to go first? Yeah, Dr. Alex, I'm gonna go. Got do psychiatric posting before. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, I, I think there's no easy way to break back bad news. Mm. Okay, so especially for children, you know, children, uh, well, when, uh, when I did general medicine many years ago, it's easier to deal with adults because they have lived a life behind, already lived a long life already. But when you're dealing with uh, children who have not yet lived, you know, and uh, one of my the 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 memories I always hold is that you know they got this uh, uh, five year boy, five years old boy, who came in with uh, severe um, encephalitis and totally brain damage, and uh, on the ventilator. And the vital signs are, are slowly going down, meaning that they have brainstem involvement. 
and the grandma will come in and he bring his favorite toys and, and tell the boy, come back, come back. Here's your favorite toy. Here's your favorite toy. It broke my heart. You weren't just thinking about that. You know? So how do you break bad news that the, the, the child is dying? It's not easy. But I, I would say that uh, we must be honest. Okay, don't give them false hope. Okay, uh, be honest on what you have done uh, and be honest what is the outcome. Okay, and be very careful in your choice of words. Because when they are desperate, uh, they will catch on to any words you say. You Not know, like, for example, you say, no, he, he, it's so bad that it would take a miracle for him to recover. And the parents, whoever is listening, will hear the word miracle. And he said, the doctor say miracle, you know. So he's going to survive. So very care be very careful, choose your word properly. Okay. So so it's not an easy one. Uh, and uh, it's something that I hate doing. Okay. You got any? Man. <laughs> that one considered like to consider bad. I also don't know what I'm saying, like, but it was a child who was uh, newly diagnosed with leukemia. He came in the middle, I think, came in about 7 p.m., then had a uh, lymphadenopathy, prolonged fever, and some hepatosplenomegaly. So we did an urgent PBF and it showed blood. Hmm. So when I told the mother, you know, that, you know, all these findings, I think I just let the mother know the findings and I told the mother we did a PPF and it actually showed some set the cells that suggest that the, they have this leukemia. Oh, the mother actually fainted. I said, oh, did I do? So it was quite a bad experience that we had to then stabilize the mother. Mm. I also find it very difficult to do ex exactly. And then every different individual probably checking back news differently as well. Like. But in terms of the choice of word, I probably usually try to show the sign as in give the evidence before the final diagnosis comes out. That's what I usually do like, if I want to break a bad news like that. So that they slowly, slowly get prepared. What am I going to say? Then finally only the words come out. Then, then after that, what I do usually, I just kept quiet and be there. Just give some silence and let the parents have some time to digest uh, and then in the process, whatever bad news that is going to be given to them. Uh, then subsequently, what I do depends on what they want to ask. And yeah, I guess that's a long time with you, Dr. Alex. I guess I work in hospital clinic now, right? So <laughs> 10 years, I don't have to break bad news. <laughs> yeah. Which is good. Which is really <laughs> to be thankful for. Yeah, but... The but the only memory of breaking bad news is the mother fainted. <laughs> I don't know about this. Like, wow. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think breaking bad news to the family is like one of the worst things in our career that you can face. Like it's kind of hard. Yeah, not but, easy. Not easy. Mm -hmm. okay, the, the next question is also kind of a serious one. So what is the most we can help patients with child abuse? other than handing it over to the police and social welfare? I'm not easy. <laughs> Do you see any child abuse case in your clinic work? Really, uh, there was one suspected. Uh, but then, in the end, I also couldn't do much. I just uh, have to just write a referral letter to the hospital. Right? It's, just, it's difficult because we have to follow up frequently. And I think as a doctor, we cannot do beyond that because we cannot do family visit. So that's for for the doctor's role, it's probably just really just identify it. And then we have to just shift over to the authority who can actually help the child. And in between, um, even if you want to try to contact the child's uh, caretaker and, and find out how, how is the child, but then once this thing happened, right? If the caretaker could be uh, the the perpetrator, then it becomes difficult for you that they actually stop. Like the patient that I referred to hospital, I don't know whether in the end she went or not. So we try to call the number or whatever number that we have in our clinic system. Then they stopped picking up our phone there. I couldn't even get hold 
of what is going on after the doctor, we actually wrote the referral letter and asked the child to go to hospital. Yeah, I find it difficult whether the doctor can really play a role beyond referring them to the necessary, the necessary authority. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, uh, what I usually do is that if I have a suspected child abuse, okay, of any form, I'll admit straight away. Okay, mm. and then I'll inform uh, social welfare and the police. Okay, so that means I make sure that they stay in the hospital. They don't run away. Either. Yeah. Because if you uh, let them go home, the police and the welfare officer will never find them. So mm. that means you make sure that the police and the welfare officer uh, uh, interview, interview the parents the in the ward. So, so that means there is first contact. Nah. But after that, we have no control because it's out of our hands. Legally, it, uh, we, uh, it's out of our hands. Is it? It's up to the social welfare worker whether uh, it will follow up or not. Okay, so I mean, it's a sad thing. I wish we can do more, but we can't. Okay, I mean, I have one patient uh, which I suspect is child abuse, but the parents are very smart. Okay, uh, he will turn up in different hospitals. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, he didn't realize that we pediatricians get together and talk to each other. You know, so he will turn up with a, a fracture, a humerus, and then uh, the mother will, will say, oh, he fell down, he's very clumsy. And then the next time he'll turn up with a bruise on the skull, in the, another hospital and all that. So, I mean, we, but the parents will stay in the ward and very, uh, and there's no other caretaker. So, so we, we were, uh, when it came to my, my turn and it uh, turned up and uh, with a, a, a fractured wrist and I admitted her, it, it's very hard to say, this is child abuse and call the police. You know, and and call the social fair, uh, welfare because what evidence do you have? Is it? Okay, so in this case, I I debate and I talk to my other colleagues and all that, and uh, none of us can make a firm decision. You know that we can uh, actually uh, get the uh, police. I actually talk to the police. You know whether we should apply for a court order to uh, put him. Uh, uh, in some way, safe is it? Yeah, but in the end, uh, we have to design AOR, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. When I heard about two months later, the child died of head injury because apparently he fell down the stairs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even at this moment, uh, I do not have any proof that it was child abuse but it's a very strong suspicion. So, so when you ask the question, it, what can we do? Actually, there's a very limited amount of things we can do, okay? Because uh, we can put pressure on the uh, social welfare department. And uh, that is what uh, Dr. Amar Singh, okay? Uh, the reti he's retired already. He used to be a state pediatrician of uh, Ipoh. Okay, uh, so he, he is very interested in child abuse. So he actually uh, have very good friends with the police department and all that, and, and the social welfare department, and, and he can get action fast. Okay. Most of us do not have this type of uh, uh, contacts. So, okay. yeah, so this is so... what is happening. Okay, this, I think we have come to the end of the Q&A session. So thank you again to our honourable speakers today. That was certainly an interesting and informative session. We hope we have more time to answer all of your amazing questions.